when I teach history courses, I can't go straight into this stuff without warming up the students a little bit because they're not really ready for it. I start out by asking about Alfred the Great and the cakes. And I say, how many people have heard the story of Alfred and the cakes? And I am lucky to get one hand in a class with 80 people in it. I probably could do a bit better here, so I'll take a chance that you all put your hands up and eliminate a quarter of my speech. Alfred and the cakes, do you know the story? Okay, you got one hand, the usual smart out of the back. <laughs> this is an astonishing thing because three generations ago, this was a story every schoolboy and schoolgirl would have known in the United Kingdom and in Canada. It was a part of our history that went back a thousand years. Now, it has the minimum drawback that it's probably apocryphal, but it is nevertheless a key piece of who Canadians and Britons and Americans thought they were for a thousand years. And it's an alarming fact that it's been lost. But before I tell the story, I want to offer you a piece of good cheer disguised as another miserable, uh, depressing factor in our current public life. Ludwig Wittgenstein once said that trying to repair a broken tradition is like trying to fix a torn spider web with your bare hands. And I think he's right about that, but I figure at least we have a spider web here. The idea of trying to establish liberty under law in a country where it wasn't part of the historical tradition would be even more appalling because you'd be asking people to rally around not being what they always have been. The people who identify with, say, Russia. And you said, let's all be free. You'd say, well, but we've never been free. And in fact, although you may feel as libertarians that this is so deeply buried that you couldn't find it with large drilling equipment suitable for making a wasteful LRT. The fact is, the legacy does exist and it can be found. So, Alfred, the only monarch who has the epithet, the great, by the way, he was king of Wessex in the darkest part of the Dark Ages. He took over the job after three of his brothers had failed. The Danes are invading, they're burning everything that they can't steal. And Alfred himself is ambushed and almost killed at Christmas in 876, which was a bad year, right? So, if you think Dark Ages, you go, yeah, 876, there we are, right in the heart of it. And he flees into the marshes of Athelney, and then the story goes that in disguise, he comes to the a peasant's hut, and he asks the, the woman if he can come in and warm himself by the fire. He's a lost and lonely traveler. And she doesn't like the look of him, but since charity is a Christian obligation, she says, yes, you can come and you can sit by the fire, but watch the little loaves, the cakes that I've got baking, because I have to go out and glean or we're not going to eat three days from now. So Alfred sits by the fire, and then he starts to think about how can I rally my men? Can I get help from Mercia? Where are the thanes? How can I defeat these miserable marauding Danes? And as he's lost in thought, he of course forgets about the little loaves, and then the next thing he knows, the hut is full of smoke, and the woman's in the door screeching at him. You know, they're bummed, you lay about it, told you you could sit by the fire. All I said was wash the cakes, now they're burned, we've got nothing to eat. What's the matter with you, you wretch? And the punchline of this story is instead of jumping to his feet and saying, foolish woman, I am the king, or swatting her head off or something, he apologizes. And then, and this part of the story is true, he actually does rally his men, and the men of Mercia. They meet at Egbert Stone, they beat the Danes, recapture London, force the Danish king to convert to Christianity and stop marauding the way he had been. Then, Alfred reorganizes the British Navy, then he teaches himself Latin, because he thinks his people have fallen into ignorance, and he wants to translate important books into Anglo-Saxon. And he becomes a byword for a king who understands that his power is given to him to serve the people, not to dominate them. To uphold laws that are just and have the consent of the community, not to do whatever he feels like. And that is why the story was told at dinner tables, parents to children for a thousand years. To say, this is the kind of ruler we have in the English-speaking world. And that is why we are more fortunate than people anywhere else. And this is not just some piece of folk eccentricity. This was part of the, the self-understanding of the Anglosphere. I often try to baffle my students by quoting a constitutional expert who says that his is a land, perhaps the only one in the universe, in which political or civil liberty is the very end and scope of the Constitution. Now, obviously, that's a very important idea if citizens believe it. And people say, yeah, that's typical of the Americans, talking about their constitution, land of liberty, blah, 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 blah. But it's not an American. It's William Blackstone describing Britain 
in the 1760s. The kind of government that the American revolutionaries take up arms to preserve that land where liberty is the very scope and end of the Constitution, and the kind of constitution that we got in 1867, right? Similar in principle to that of the United Kingdom. Now, if you look at our, at our constitution, you can see right away that in several important respects, it's not similar to that of the United Kingdom. For instance, it's federal and it's written. You say, well, what's going on? Where are the people who founded Canada just babblers? This is normally the impression of some drunken deal makers who didn't give a whit for principle. Not true and not fair. I'll come back to it. But what is similar in principle is that ours is a system in which law comes from the consent of the governed and the state is limited to the basic task of protecting your life and your property. And it is not meant to do a bunch of other things. And this is all lost now, but it was not lost on the people who made the Canadian Constitution.